started back in 1981, so it was our first specialty beer. I got into dry hopping and doing all sorts of uh, fairly adventurous brewing for the time. I did want to brew a specialty beer for the holidays. I went up to Yakima, uh, which I've done pretty much every year since uh, since my homebrew shop days. So we came out with Celebration Ale, and it was our first uh, production dry hop beer. And we made about 90 cases total. So uh, our first Celebration Ale was uh, Truly really memorable beer. It was just delicious. Uh, a celebration was 16 Plato, so we uh, kicked up the amount of malt. We added uh, uh, some caramel malt. It's a staple. Um, we're, we're always using a blend of Centennial and Cascade. And so we had these four open tanks, and we would go into uh, initially six horizontal 10-barrel uh, fermenters or storage tanks that I. I welded up. So early on, uh, w w we charged a dollar more a case for celebration. Yeah. Created a lot of challenges uh, when the bags are wet. When we're done with them, they're you know way, way, way heavier than when we put them in initially, and so they're all hanging and dripping. This is just the first part of my fascinating visit with Ken Grossman, the founder of Sierra Nevada. Thank you so much for watching. Your views and support make these conversations possible. Now, hitting that subscribe button is actually transformative to the channel. But oddly, 73% of you have not done so yet. So if you like what you see, please consider hitting those like and subscribe buttons to fuel our channel's growth and its clout and its ability to attract even more awesome guests. Thank you and cheers. So I've learned that Celebration Ale is not just another Sierra Nevada flavor of the month. Nope. It, it appears to be something that you're willing to turn the brewery almost upside down once a year to do. So tell me about that. How did that get started? Well, it started back in 1981. So it was our first specialty beer we made outside of our lineup, which at the time was Pale Ale, Porter, and Stout. We had three products out uh, year-round, and our very first year of full brewing, uh, 1981, we brewed Celebration Ale. And um, as home brewers, uh, I, you might know my history a little bit, but I started out home brewing in 1969, and um, yeah, a long time ago. And uh, I got into dry hopping and doing all sorts of uh, fairly adventurous brewing for the time. I mean, Back in the uh, late 70s or late 60s, early 70s, there wasn't a whole lot of knowledge about how to make great beer and how to do things like dry hopping and you know, propagate your own yeast and all the things that a good home brewer today knows how to do. Uh, back then, uh, really, we were sort of on our own to, to discover. And so I started dry hopping beers as a home brewer. Um, I'd read about it in, in one of the brewing books and, and continued on with that tradition. And, when we started Sierra Nevada, um, we didn't want to have our uh, all of our standard products get dry hopped just because of the complexity and time and our inability to do that um, at, at sort of that scale. Uh, but we did want to brew a specialty beer for the holidays. And, and actually our first year label was quite a bit different and it was Celebration Ale, but it said it was a Christmas beer um, without spices or herbs. It was uh, going to be just focused on hops. and. As a hop lover, I went up to Yakima, uh, which I've done pretty much every year since uh, since my homebrew shop days. So, wow. in the, the mid mid seventies, I started going to Yakima at least once a year, and some years, numerous times. Uh, but I went up and selected uh, a special lot of hops for Celebration Ale, and it was actually a baby field of Cascades that just smelled amazing. They were in in perfect uh, maturity, and um, I said, "We got to use this in a special beer." And so uh, when we were coming into the holiday season, we said, let's, let's make a, a beer for the holidays. And so we came out with Celebration Ale and it was our first uh, production dry hopped beer. And we made about 90 cases total. That was uh, one, one 10 barrel batch. And uh, we didn't know, you know if it was gonna um, meet the consumer's expectations. And, you know, back in the, in the late seventies, early eighties, there was no craft beer uh, industry and so we were pushing the boundaries with our pale ale at, at, uh, at 38 bitterness units, and here we wanted to make a very floral, aromatic, uh, hoppy um, IPA, and so uh, our first celebration ale was a truly memorable beer. It was just delicious, uh, and normally baby hops, uh, first year uh, hops, um, 
aren't quite as aromatic or quite as, as, uh, as large of a cone anyway. I won't say they're less aromatic. But so they're usually smaller cones their first year. Uh, and Yakima, Washington is a unique growing region in the world, actually, uh, where you can plant a, a hop a rhizome um, and you can have pretty much a full harvest year one. And that doesn't happen anywhere else. Uh, Oregon, they have to wait till the second year. And most of Europe, yeah, would take uh, a second year uh, in order to get a mature enough vine that it would produce hops. Uh, but anyway, we picked this baby field because it was just perfectly ripe and, and really aromatic. And that was the genesis of Celebration Ale and our first uh, commercially dry hop beer. Yeah, so the, the Celebration Ale recipe, we knew we wanted to be a bit higher in gravity and then our pale ale, um, which was about 13 Play-Doh uh, when we started. Uh, Celebration was 16 Play-Doh, so we uh, kicked up the amount of malt. We added uh, uh, some caramel malts, so we used uh, a small percentage of roast malts in our pale ale, but we increased those a bit in the Celebration Ale. Uh, we wanted to heavily hop it, and having sort of a good malt backbone uh, helps to have those kinds of beers be in balance. I mean, today the, the IPA trends are usually a bit drier and less roasted malts, but back then when we were first doing this, uh, we wanted a, a little darker color and some uh, caramel malt notes. And so that was our recipe. It was all Cascades when we started. Um, and that was before Centennial was a, was a thing. And when Centennial hops, uh, we actually first started using what would be called Centennial hops when it was a numbered variety uh, in the early 80s. And um, so we played around with that uh, in addition to, to Cascade Hops and Celebration Ale recipe. And now it's a staple. Um, we're, we're always using a blend of Centennial and Cascade. So using caramel malts is a little unusual, especially even for your brewery. You don't use caramel malts in very many things, do you? Uh, we use a small percentage in, in a, a, a fair amount of recipes, but. Uh, some of our newer IPAs uh, that tend to be a little bit drier, lighter in color, uh, we might use Munich or some other kind of malt and, and not so much rely on a, a caramelized malt, but uh, we don't use caramel, we use uh, you know, what would be called crystal or uh, caramel malt by various maltsters, but it, you know, it's a malt that undergoes a, a roasting in the malt house uh, when it's wet. So it actually you know, produces enzymes in the kernel that then get caramelized as sugars when it's roasted. So you get some of those nice toffee and caramel characters out of it. So, so how did that first uh, 90 cases go? It was wonderful. Uh, it was totally memorable. And, and uh, there's still, I still have some of those original bottles that are full. Um, that are full? That are full. Um, <laughs> I, I wouldn't suggest drinking them, but um, uh, uh, it was in a long neck. So we started out in a returnable bottle. Um, our first Your year. Your returnable bottles or someone else's? Uh, well, they were ours after we filled them, but uh, um, I was buying them from um, beer distributors, from brewers, yeah. okay. uh, from some defunct breweries. So they all had labels on them. We, we had a, a bottle washer uh, at our brewery. Uh, our first brewery had a, a, a real bottle washer. So we could remove labels and sterilize the bottles for refilling. And we originally thought, well, we charge a nickel deposit and people would return the bottles. And, uh, that didn't work out very well, so we uh, pretty quickly ran out of uh, a good bottle supply and we were forced to switch into uh, what was then a stock bottle. Our current bottle is not a stock bottle, but back then we switched into a bottle called the Heritage Bottle. And uh, it's uh, similar to the, to the shape we use today. We, we didn't plan on being in this room, but we're in an interesting room. And I've had the fortune of actually seeing one of these in open fermentation to celebrate yeah. your ale. So can you talk about that and why that's important? Sure. Um, yeah, so our, our original brewery um, was all home built and the fermenters were old dairy tanks that I picked up and I was fortunate enough to find four identical dairy tanks. Um, and so we actually had four uh, open 10 barrel uh, fermenters. and. Um, I'd studied refrigeration uh, when I was in um, junior college. After I decided to start a brewery, I, I left uh, Chico State, went back to the junior college, and I took uh, all sorts of classes that I thought would be helpful. Some business classes, I took uh, electrical wiring classes, I took refrigeration repair, and so I actually did all the refrigeration work. But So I converted these dairy tanks to uh, operate at a little warmer temperature so we could make ales in them. And so we had these four open tanks and we would go into 
uh, initially six horizontal 10-barrel um, fermenters or storage tanks that I, I welded up and uh, eventually we uh, added a few more of those and then as business uh, grew a bit we went into some 60-barrel tanks uh, but we had open fermenters from the very beginning and we still uh, have open fermenters in Chico and here as well. Uh, in Chico we have 100 barrel open fermenters and we still do things like Celebration Ale and Bigfoot in the opens. Uh, and then when I was designing this brewery I decided well we need to at least have some ability to, to have open fermentation. Um, you know the lower hydrostatic head on the, the fermenter uh, allows the yeast to operate uh, a little bit better particularly when you get into high gravity uh, and high hopped beers. And so uh, we stuck with using some opens for specialty brewing. So I think it's fascinating, the, the effort that goes back to that original recipe, but what it takes to actually brew this once a year. What, what is it about celebration personally for you when you brew it each year? Because you know the brewery almost has to switch over. Yep. As I can tell, I mean, their pipes get disconnected, bottoms get taken off. Mm -hmm people as training classes because of the uh, challenges of working with this. It, that's got to have a different cost model to it, and but there must be a reason that you're willing to kind of go to that effort and brew such a wonderful beer. Yeah, so early on, uh, w w we charged a dollar more a case for Celebration Ale, um, and uh, currently it's, it's this line price with our other IPAs. Um, but we, uh, we sort of evolved over the years. So our process in the very beginning uh, was the open fermentation, and then we had pumped the beer when it still had uh, a little bit of extract, one or two Play-Doh uh, left, into a closed tank with a big bag of hops. And uh, we're a primarily a whole cone hop brewer, and we still are today, but we were 100% back then. Um, and so we started stitching up these big mesh bags, and we would weight them down in the bottom of the fermenters or we eventually ended up putting little uh, stainless steel hooks that we weld into the fermenters to clip the bag on uh, and then we would allow the beer to come up through the bottom purge the the air out of the uh, fermenter and then finish fermenting on the hop bed and as we grew to uh, a new facility in chico um, we continued to do open fermentation and closed cellar tanks uh, and then as we needed more capacity, we started adding some conical tanks, and that's where we had to get creative and, and modify the conical tanks in order to uh, put hot bags in them. And so I don't know if you saw the 400 barrel tanks right behind me here, uh, but they have a big trolley work uh, above them uh, that allows us to open the bottom cone, um, drop a stainless steel chain in uh, through the top with a, a big heavy winch, uh, and then hoist the uh, empty bags, uh, or bags full of dry hops, up into the fermenter, close the bottom, fill the tanks up with beer, and continue to do the same process of fermenting the end fermentation on hops. And created a lot of challenges. Uh, when the bags are wet, when we're done with them, they're you know way, way, way heavier than what we put them in initially. And so they're all hanging and dripping, and um, we, we produce a product uh, uh, called hop drippings here where we actually collect those hops that drip off the bags and it's a supercharged uh, version of Celebration Ale. Um, but we empty the beer up in uh, the tank and you know th those hops are now mixed with yeast that's clinging onto the bags and so they're they're quite um, messy for the brewers to uh, have to lower and slowly lower and cut the bags uh, or take the bags off the, the stainless steel chain. Um, and um, get rid of them after a couple of days letting them drip off. So yeah, quite a process. But it, but it totally disrupts, I think, your normal work. It does. It's yeah. totally outside your normal production schedule. It, it is, and, and what, what complicates it, certainly for our sales folks, is we don't start brewing until uh, the varieties and the fields we want are harvested. And so we send an advanced team up uh, to Oregon and Washington um, uh, a couple weeks in advance of the hops being fully mature, and they go look at fields, and um, you know they'll cruise uh, Oregon and Washington fields, looking for um, what we hope will be the next hops in Celebration Ale. And um, we've been choosing Oregon the last few years. They have a a little different growing season. Um, you know, it's a little bit wetter. They're a little further south, um, but the Cascades tend to be a little bit earlier um, from that area. Maybe a three days to a week earlier. 
And so we'll typically at this point select some of the hops out of Oregon um, and some out of, uh, out of Washington as well. But they're all hand selected for Celebration Hill. Everyone is so excited though. When you hear all summer long, or when I'm up here visiting, I'll hear the brewers talking about celebration season. It's the end of the year for most people, but they seem to have a whole new perspective, like it's a recharge for the whole year. Can you tell me about that? Well, again, the, the, the process is, is quite unique. We don't do that, uh, that level of, uh, uh, of uh, hand work and all the bags in the tanks and all that for uh, other beers. We've, uh, you know, we've created the torpedo process, which also uses whole hops, and it's a yep. way uh, of allowing us to do some of that dry hopping external to the tank. And so uh, the genesis actually of the, of the first torpedo was uh, our inability to make any more celebration ale. Uh, we were maxed out. Uh, we had uh, you know, a certain amount of tanks that we could potentially dry hop in, and those were all full during celebration ale season. So that was the limiting factor was uh, we just couldn't age any more beer on hops uh, in the narrow time, time slot. So as I, I mentioned, the, you know, we don't start brewing until the hops are harvested. Well, the hops aren't, you know, they start coming off in August and then you know, we might not get the ones we want until the first week in September. And a lot of other uh, holiday beers are already on the market by the time uh, our hops are all harvested. And so we have a very compressed production window in order to get the beer brewed and packaged and into the market before the end of the year. And so um, we've worked hard at that and developing the torpedoes allowed us to use other tanks that were not normally uh, or not able to be dry hopped in uh, to, to have that same uh, hop, hopping character of using whole cone hops. So Celebration is, and I guess it's not the only one, but that the effort to brew Celebration and brew it in large volume it seems like it's almost like the genesis for even more ideas within the brewery. I mean, how you're managing whole cone hops. I've been to a lot of breweries, certainly not all of them, but I don't see whole cone hops. And, but to brew celebration, you've got to have what kind of hops to, I mean, really, I know they're whole cone, but they're, what, what is it about whole cones and that celebration can only be brewed in, over the past couple of months? Um, you know, we think that, uh, you know, when you take the hop and you pulverize it, so if you're making pellets or, or other hop products, um, that uh, hammer milling that takes place uh, during that processing does change the character uh, of how the hop uh, tastes in the beer. Uh, you're getting a lot of you know, ground up leaf matter. Uh, you're getting uh, ruptured glands, um, which dissipates some of the aromas during that uh, um, shredding process. Uh, and so we've always felt that the, the characteristics of the whole cone, uh, particularly in dry hopping, is, is unique and it's something we've wanted to maintain in celebration. Uh, I'm not saying that other types of hops don't give you uh, great um, aspects of, of uh, their aroma and are easier to brew with, uh, but we've wanted to keep this beer the way we originally brewed it. So uh, as close as possible, we've continued to, uh, to do the same dry hopping regime. Well, it certainly seems like you've been successful with that. Uh, I'm anxious. I hope we get to go into the hop room and, and talk a little bit more about those. Parts two and three with my interview with Ken are equally fascinating as we continue our discussion in Sierra Nevada's hop, milling, and laboratory sections. If you found value in this video, please go ahead and smash that like button. It really supports us in creating more content like this. And before you go, check out these videos on the screen. They've been carefully selected just for you, and they're filled with even more brewing insights and tips. Thank you and cheers.